Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the main stage. We have an outstanding list of subject matter experts joining us this afternoon. Keynote addresses from Professor Jeff Kosif and Mr. Chris Inglis, Sergeant Major Denver Dill from the United States Military Academy Band, a fireside chat with the FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks, and Ambassador Timo Koster from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Right now, I would like to introduce Professor Jeff Kosef, Assistant Professor of Cybersecurity Law at the United States Naval Academy, and Mr. Chris Inglis, former Deputy Director of the National Security Agency. Professor Kosef will be ta talking to Mr. Inglis about his thoughts on defending Ford and other current issues related to cyber conflict. So thank you so much for having us here. Uh, I'll just give a disclaimer uh, that might just apply to me, but also perhaps to you, that uh, we're speaking on our own behalf and not on behalf of the DOD, Naval Academy, Department of Navy, especially me. I'm not speaking on behalf of uh, the DOD, and you'll probably see why in a little bit. Uh, so I actually, uh, I've been at the Naval Academy for four and a half years, and there are a lot of amazing things about it. And one of the most amazing things about my job in particular is that uh, the cyber department at the Naval Academy is in temporary headquarters as our cyber building is almost fully constructed. Uh, we're in Leahy Hall, for those of you who have been to the Naval Academy know is uh, perhaps not the prime location on the yard. Uh, it's a former infirmary from about 100 years ago. Uh, so we share offices and my first day I found out I was sharing an office with Chris Inglis, which was incredibly exciting. Uh, and the way I would introduce Chris is probably through a story from that first week. Uh, I was getting settled in my office and uh, mid walked in, he looked a little confused. I was just there, Chris wasn't in the office at the time. And I said, can I help you? And he said, yeah, uh, who's the guy from the NSA? And I said, are you talking about Chris Inglis? And he said, well, there's someone who used to work at the NSA who I think might be able to help me with my SF-86 with questions about how to fill it out. And I, I said, you know he was the deputy director of the NSA, and he just looked at me like, so? And I, I said, you know, he, he was, ran day-to-day -day operations of the National Security Agency, and still no, no real reaction. Chris comes back into the office, sits down with him, and helps him out with any questions that he has about filling out his application. And that's about all that I need to tell you about Chris. Uh, he has been incredibly, an incredible asset throughout this entire time as we've been standing up our cyber efforts and the MIDs and the Naval Academy are incredibly fortunate to have him here. So, so Jeff, I don't want to talk you out of asking any hard <laughs> questions, but if I could kind of give you a shot in the other, opposite direction. I don't have any no, but the National Journal just came up with their top list of 50 people who are moving and shaking Washington, D.C., and Jeff's on the list. So well done, Jeff. And while I've been a student of the law for 25 years or more for reasons that you can only imagine, and I've learned more in the last five years about the nuances and subtleties of that from Jeff, all kindly delivered, all patiently delivered, and so it's just been a real pleasure to room with you. Well, likewise. So uh, we, I guess we can get into some questions, and I will uh, start off with a fairly broad one. Uh, over the course of your distinguished career, you've seen the evolution of cyber threats to our nation. Um, we talk about this a lot at work, but I want you to give us an idea of what keeps you up the most. What, uh, what do you uh, worry about the most? Upon right advice of counsel, oh, I'm sorry, it's the wrong place, <laughs> wrong place for that. Uh, um, that's a great question. I wish I could say what uh, Secretary Mattis said, which is I don't lie awake at night, I cause other people to lie awake at night, but I do lie awake at night. Um, and, and what I think I worry about more than anything else is the divisiveness, the incivility that has crept into or stormed into American society. Um, I don't think it's been induced so much as it's been exacerbated by the efforts of the Russians and others, uh, but it's something that we have to fix, only we can fix. And until we fix that, uh, we're going to have all sorts of problems that will be exacerbated, not just by the Russians, but by the scope and scale of cyber methods. Um, that will essentially overwhelm us with information we're not quite prepared to digest or make sense of. And so that I think we have to fix. There's going to be a mix of cyber mechanisms that help us get our arms around that. But more than anything else, it's going to take some positive, compelling, transcendent leadership that gets us all to focus back on what perhaps might be our 
unifying goals and get to a place where we once again believe that the competition of ideas is our best ideas, as opposed to the competition of ideas is a way for one or the other of us to win. That's really not the game that we should be playing here in the States. And, and really until recently, and perhaps even currently, discussion about cyber threats has really focused on the cyber Pearl Harbor, cyber September 11th, the big attacks. And is that what we should be focusing on? Or when, when you're talking about these, uh, all of these other threats we're facing, is it really lower level? Or is, do we just worry about everything? Or? If I did a Pareto analysis, sure. if you kind of said allocate your time and attention according to the things that are most likely to happen, or perhaps most significant if they do happen, that would probably be last on the list. It'd be on the list, but that'd be last on the list. Um, I think the thing that we should be worried about before that is the slow, insidious corrosion um, of our confidence in these digital infrastructures such that we might then fail to use them for all of their potential. Um, we can solve cancer. We're on the path to doing that. Um, we can solve global warming. We can bring to bear massive processing, analytics, synthesis of all those data sets. But we have to have confidence that that will then serve our purpose. Uh, we can achieve efficiency and effectiveness in our societies, liberal democracies um, that are unknown to previous generations, but we have to have confidence in those digital infrastructures. And so it's the slow, insidious creep um, of the Dow, the lack of confidence in that, that I think is the more worrisome problem. We have to restore confidence in many ways. One, we have to figure out how do we actually do the right hardware, software, kind of the roles, responsibility, the basic due diligence and the foundations. We then have to defend that enterprise and everybody has a role to play in that. That's not the precious few who have cyber in their name. Everyone needs to play a role in defending that um, enterprise. Um, C, we need to have uh, somebody, maybe everybody needs to participate in critical thinking such that we're not so credulous when we see something at the surface, we imagine that that must then be true. Um, so that we can use these tools, bend them to our purpose um, in a way that um, we can then worry about those things that might be the extraordinary episodic events like the thunderclap in the night of a Pearl Harbor. But that's not what we're going to lose on. We're going to lose on the things that sneak up on us. It's a lot like global warming in my view. If you ask, you know, what, what does it take to fix that? You've got to go back 20 years. Um, what's it take to actually do something about that now? You're going to have to do a heck of a lot of work. Um, and perhaps roll through some very imperfect times um, in the near term in order to get your arms around that. Um, the other reason I'm not as worried about um, the Pearl Harbor, though that could happen, um, I'm not as worried about that, is that the world is increasingly converged on the same digital infrastructure. There's no incentive for an adversary of ours to essentially take it out in such a massive way that they themselves would be kind of subject to the same sort of you know, down downstream effects. It's not to say that if it came to a kinetic fight, if it came to an existential fight, that they wouldn't. Um, but, but I'm thinking that at this moment in time, nobody wants to take us on in a head-to-head -head contest. That's actually a specific objective of the Russians, to never, ever, ever take us on in a head-to-head -head contest. And therefore, peacetime is the decisive phase. It's the insidious gray zone actions that take place in peacetime we should be worried about. And how does the defend forward operational concept and persistent engagement strategy, how does that fit in to those threats? Uh, quite nicely, I think. Um, I think Defend Forward, while, while it happens to have been um, trademarked by um, cyber forces, United States military cyber forces, I think it's a quite useful concept for every instrument of power that we might bring to bear. Uh, my, my sense of what Defend Forward really means, leaving cyber aside, is to kind of make it such that you have some discernment about threats to you, um, whether it's in digital infrastructure, maybe it's perhaps in the strategic societal underpinnings, but you have senses of what those threats are at the earliest possible moment. You're cognizant, you're aware, you're essentially trying to figure out through persistent engagement of the environment that you're in, uh, where am I really? Is there something that is going to be brought to bear that I should take care of now as it's on the rise, as opposed to wait until perhaps it's almost too late and I wind up doing that um, catch and carry in the least efficient way by running around catching the arrows. Um, so that's the first part of it. The second part is um, defend forward means that if I in fact have some confidence that there's a provocateur, uh, therefore a provo provocation coming my way, um, I reserve the right to defend myself and I reserve the right to do that with the highest leverage available to me, which is I'm gonna go forward and do it at the point you know, of its instance right, where it actually is, is, has begun. Now, there's some challenges in that, which is that we might describe the space between us and an adversary as protected space that's owned by innocent parties, perhaps neutral parties, used to call it the gray zone, 
Um, that is a challenge, but if in fact at the end of the day we're going to hold ourselves accountable to the same enduring principles that the use of kind of influence or force has always been held to, necessity and proportionality, I think that we can get there from here. We can say it is by necessity something we must do, and we'll do it proportionate to whatever that compelling cause is and be held accountable if there are some collateral effects outside of that um, that we hadn't anticipated but we could reasonably help be held accountable for. Um, now, I've said all of that in a way that might kind of be music to the ears of folks who, def who define, defend forward in the cyber context. But, but I could have described that for diplomacy. I could have described that for the use of financial sanctions. I could have described it in the same way for the use of legal, um, either indictments or criminal pursuit. All of those instruments should be brought to bear, in my view, in exactly the same way. Um, and I would say one thing more, which is that given that we've had um, in the last year and a half a fundamental change in how we think about the use of cyber, defend forward for cyber purposes, uh, we've begun to think our way through the sovereignty aspects. I, Jeff would be the first to tell you I'm not a trained lawyer. Um, you know, I, I might be perhaps kind of down on the scale but in terms of that. There's still time. There's still time. I read the Constitution every other day, and I've almost got it. Um, but, but I'm not a trained lawyer, but I would say the following. Um, and I borrow some of this from General Mike Hayden, who I thought gave a very interesting um, kind of way of describing this. He said, um, we're all keenly familiar with the physical jurisdictions, right? Physical jurisdictions by which we govern the affairs of mankind on physical territory. Um, he says, but if you stick your hand up um, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, you're still in the physical jurisdiction. But when you get to 55 kilometers, you're in space. At some point, you've entered a different domain where we have this sense of the kind of the thread that goes from actor to kind of the thing that you might act upon. Um, that's a thread that you would say, that's space. And there's a certain jurisdiction that then attends to that, which transcends or perhaps is relieved of the burdens of the physical jurisdictions on the ground. But my view is, is that if you stick your hand into the muck and mire of cyberspace, stick it down, right, there's got to be some place where we say, I'm now in cyberspace, and the thread from actor to whatever the influence or the target of that actor is, that actually is the governing sovereign territory. And so long as you're operating within that channel and you don't have untoward effects outside of that channel, we can have some confidence that it's an appropriate act for you to take in that channel from actor to the kind of thing that the actor is influencing without regard, without perhaps being cravenly, um, perhaps prostrating yourself at the physical jurisdictions that just make it so hard to figure out where you are. Um, if you want to stop an attack that's coming at you and it's hopping from server to server, from perhaps Europe to Asia to the United States in milliseconds time, um, you cannot be um, in a place where you may not defend yourself because the jurisdiction hobbles you at every turn. It has to be that at some point I'm going to stick my hand into cyberspace, I'm going to interdict that attack, and so long as that's all I've done, based on that necessity, you should be fine. So you have a really unique vantage point uh, between uh, military, civilian government, <laughs> academia, and private sector. Um, is there both the knowledge and skill base as well as the political willpower to address these really evolving threats that you're talking about? I would say that there is some degree of, um, most people don't have cyber in their job title, don't think about cyber as anything other than a commodity that operates at their beck and call. Right? So if you're a cyber policy specialist, if you're a cyber operator, if you're perhaps an IT person or something more, more cyber specific in a company, you probably think about this, but, but even then you think about these issues in silos and stovepipes. The private sector is still defending the architectures, the digital um, infrastructure that they build and operate. The government is still largely capable of defending those things that are clearly in the national interest, but those things that perhaps are cascading downstream kind of in the supply chain into that national interest, we quite don't know how to solve those things. Uh, my view is, is that um, everyone um, kind of who participates in society needs to have as much an understanding about the role of digital infrastructure in their lives, the responsibilities they have to make good and, and kind of effective use of that as they do about driving a car. Right? Um, and, and even if you're not going to drive a car, you need to know something about the rules of cars that kind of go by um, the pathways, the crosswalks that you'll be in. Um, and yet we don't do that. We do have this sense um, as a society that it'll take care of itself because we're raising digital natives. Um, I, I think the people that I have met at the Naval Academy, the 17 to 21 year olds, and some number of them from places like West Point of the Air Force Academy, they are brilliant beyond all um, expectations. And I couldn't compete with them. I probably couldn't get into a service academy today. But having said that, um, by and large, they're not digital natives. They're app natives, right? They can tell you how to use the things that exist on the surface, 
but they don't know enough about the implications of how the stuff underneath works in order to make the thoughtful choices that they must as they go forward and command um, either armies in the field or weapon systems in the field, or frankly, as they become hedge fund managers or as they do things of consequence, depending upon digital infrastructure in the private sector. And so having said all of that, uh, my view is, is that there's a basic program of education that we ought to give our kids and our, everyone in society about this is how this stuff actually works, not to make you a geek, not to make it such that you can hack or do reconnaissance, just so you know how to actually do your part, your small but vital part in this. And then there is a certain amount of education that we need to give the people who build and operate this infrastructure, who don't think that they have cyber in their name and therefore don't think that that's their responsibility. They might be systems engineers, they might be software engineers that have some primary function, maybe it's the autonomous car in mind, they need to do a little bit more in order to make this stuff such that it is properly resilient and robust and defendable. And then finally, we need to make sure that the folks who are defending the digital infrastructure see that they're in common cause with everybody else that's defending um, this infrastructure, because that's how the adversaries look at it. Um, they don't look at it as, I'm going to attack this network and then that network and then that network. They traverse willy-nilly across those networks. They might come to land in a particular physical jurisdiction, but they've essentially taken advantage of the interconnected nature of that to go at the thing that they want using everything between them and, and, uh, and the target of interest. And uh, during your time at the Naval Academy, you've taught a number of classes uh, ranging from the introductory cybersecurity class that's required of all plebes to cyber policy, human factors. Uh, what has that taught you about addressing, about the capacity to be able to sort of have this knowledge base and education? Yeah, so the Naval Academy, and I think not unlike the other service academies, you know, we, we had this um, kind of thought experiment a few years ago of, can you in fact take a, an undergraduate and get everything into a program such that they know enough um, ab about the digital infrastructure, the use of that digital infrastructure um, to within a baccalaureate program essentially have some meaningful facility in what we would describe as cyber. Um, and we made that a little bit harder by describing cyber not as a subset of computer science but rather as something that stands beside computer science. So it's got a little bit of computer science in there, that's not a pejorative term, but it's got enough in there so that you understand how the stuff actually works. It's got some human factors in there because that's an important vital component of the systems we know as digital infrastructure. It's got something in there about law ethics because in America and other liberal democracies represented in the room, uh, we act in a particular way. It's not the end justifies any means. We have to actually think about the means as well. So we built a program along those lines and the very pleasant surprise for me um, is that the students have embraced that and they're actually thriving in that. They, they can in four years time, actually in two and a half years time when they double down and concentrate on the major, um, get quite a lot um, kind of in their kind of intellectual in their heads um, such that they can make meaningful use of all of that um, and ultimately understand how to conduct operations in a world dependent upon cyber. Because um, at the Naval Academy, again, um, not unlike other institutions, when we say a cyber operations major, it's really a major in operations in a world dependent upon cyber. Cyber is the minor kind of component, operations is the major component. Um, and, and having said all of that, the very pleasant surprise is it has not come at the cost of our deep technical and sharp majors like computer science, computer engineering. We're getting an upsurge in those. At the same time, we're getting an upsurge in cyber majors. And, and what I have found is that the people who kind of aspire or kind of are, are, are most inspired by the cyber major are the folks that think in terms of systems. They think horizontally. That's really important. Um, you know, what my early remarks, if they're true, if what we really need in this domain is more integration, more collaboration across what look like kind of hard boundaries, then we're going to need systems thinkers, critical thinkers. And I think that we have that coming at us. Mm -hmm. And now stepping back to these challenges we're facing, um, is, are we, the United States, primarily reactive to these issues, to these challenges? Are we being proactive and anticipating them? And is that changing at all? Uh, we're still, in my view, largely reactive. Um, it's, it's really hard to be proactive when um, there are so many people who are innovating, uh, literally billions of people who are innovating. Um, and if you want to be the one smart person who tries to figure out what that Borg is going to kind of come to, um, you have to actually synthesize all of that and, and then take some amount of serendipity, mix that in, throw the dice, and then you understand what's going to happen next. Um, so, so that being said, we're probably um, kind of condemned to being fast followers um, or perhaps to kind of induce a certain number of initiatives where we're, we're kind of forcing other people to follow us. 
But, but let me just give you a case in point. Um, Defense Science Board a couple of years ago did a study on uh, deterrence, cyber deterrence. Spent the better part of two, two and a half years um, studying that and, and came up with some excellent, some extraordinarily um, superb insights about the nature of what deterrence is, how that might then convey into cyber differently than in how perhaps it would have worked um, with uh, instruments of nuclear power or even traditional um, kinetic instruments, and came up with a set of kind of then strategies and lines of effort that this nation or other nations should undertake to essentially um, deter other parties from using cyber to kind of deter us from undertaking the course of action that we might. And in those two and a half years, and that report I think was produced somewhere in the neighborhood of 2016, um, it never came up that uh, we had to deter kind of institutions or nation states from using cyber as a mechanism to hack us, right? To use it in an influence campaign, to use it in a kind of a, a campaign of ideas. Um, we all thought about the digital infrastructure and perhaps um, how, how would we deter them from making inappropriate use of the data or the infrastructures um, and the things that were tangibly, objectively, directly dependent upon those. But when you look at the campaign that the Russians undertook in 2016 against us as a nation, um, they probably did that at three different levels. At one level, they were certainly doing the basic um, blocking and tackling, kind of hacking emails, running troll farms, releasing illicit or sometimes carefully releasing factual information, but all in a mode where you could say, I know how to fix that to do the better attribution, to block and tackle that. That's an information assurance problem. But at the second level, what they were doing was using the abstractions of all of that to hold at risk a critical infrastructure we know as the election system. Uh, we thought our way through that as well. We said, I think I know how to defend against that. What we need is a collaboration between 54 states and territories. Uh, that's a slightly different approach, building on the foundations of cyber underneath. Um, and if you at that point are comfortable and kind of can rest from your labors with your arms folded, proud that you've actually kind of deduced the game is up, um, the Russians were actually operating at the third level, right? First maybe being checkers, the second being chess. They're playing Go, right? They're at the third level, and what they're doing is they're hacking us. And back to an earlier point that I made, which is they're actually quite wise as to the nature of this society, which is now kind of on the edge of trying to figure out whether diversity is a strength or whether diversity is a burden, whether the divisiveness they see in our society from, from abroad is something that they need to perhaps uh, push back on because it's our greatest strength, or whether they can lean in and perhaps exacerbate that because it could be a weakness. That's what they took advantage of, and nothing in those two and a half years of study thought through that to say that's what we should perhaps be countering. Now, now why is that? Um, what was perhaps the limitation on that innovation? A couple of things. Um, one might be that we're so careful as scientists um, to essentially say, so I'm going to stick to my knitting. This is the question I've been asked. The question to the right of me or to the left of me is somebody else's question to, ask, to answer. So you might think, well, that's kind of psyops or that's inflama inflama in influence campaigns or information operations. It's somebody else's to kind of solve and settle. Um, that's not how our adversaries think about that. All right, if they can pick up half of one thing and a quarter of another thing and a third of a, of, of a third thing and put that together in some meaningful way, they'll use that together um, as a coherent, integrated set of activities against us. And we, therefore, if we're really going to innovate, need to think about how do we actually lower the boundaries between those things we think are the kind of the traditional delimiters between the various instruments of power that we might think our way through. How do we combine those in a way that are increasingly coherent? And how do we think like an adversary when we're defending ourselves, when we're kind of raised, trained and raised to think in careful, conservative ways um, about doing all of those things that we've been specifically authorized to do? Shouldn't lose our values along the way, but we need to think like a Russian when we think about defending an American. And uh, how confident are you that we've learned the lessons from 2016 to... Well, we've learned all the lessons from 2016. We haven't learned the lessons from 2019. That's the problem. <laughs> and so... Um, so, so we can defend ourselves to fairly well against what they did in 2016. Um, the question is whether we're kind of up against a wily, kind of agile, thoughtful, creative adversary, and I think we are. Um, and, and so we need to think about how do we actually get line ahead. Um, back to the kind of topic of this conference, I think Defend Forward has, has built into it perhaps some of the seeds of the remedy, which is it's no longer good enough for us to say we can stand back and react well. That was really the strategy we had before. So we'll just wait on shore until something comes into our environment and we'll be clever enough, fast enough, agile enough to actually catch it. Um, if, if that's a swarm of 500 drones that kind of breaks from the centroid at the moment it hits us, good luck with that. 
Um, if that's 300,000 kind of implants that again do the same thing, good luck with that. You have to actually go to the source. You have to understand it in its incipient phase um, such that you might then perhaps at least be a fast follower in that regard. If not, think your way ahead of how do I actually put them on the back foot? So here's a couple of ideas, right? Without trying to figure out what they're gonna do next and perhaps think about what their innovation is gonna lead them to, maybe the innovation on our side is we crowdsource them the way they crowdsource us. What does that mean? That means if you're gonna beat somebody, some entity, some organization within the United States, you have gotta beat all of them because they're integrated and collaborating in a way that you've never seen before. If there's a threat to one of them, it's immediately radioed across, maybe at the technology level, certainly at the human level, but there's a degree of collaboration that says, something that hits me on my far right flank, despite the fact that that's three, organiz three organizations away, I already have the benefit of that, I already have the foresight of that, such that when it comes through, I can deal with that. Um, that, I think, would take some of our adversaries by surprise because they use the fissures and the boundaries and the legal jurisdiction distinctions um, to our disadvantage. Um, if, in fact, an adversary knew that they had to beat all of us to beat one of us, uh, they might perhaps um, suffer what we would call deterrence by denial. And if they still came at us, then we could kind of, if we did this in a defend forward mechanism, using all the instruments of power at our disposal, and bring the private sector up as well. I'm not arguing for hackback, but the private sector has real and material authority within their infrastructures. Bring them up to the line as well. Um, then we can impose consequences on an adversary and we can sweep up what, what remains um, on that field. And, and then to some degree, um, what, what I've argued for is a degree of entanglement between all the affected parties, which is another aspect of deterrence that actually has worked well over time. Um, such that we're not likely to do each other harm if we're in fact engaged in some common activity, if we're actually collaborating going forward on something of common interest. And, and you'd mentioned earlier there are, at least for election systems, putting aside the campaigns, we're dependent on the 54 state and territorial systems as well as county election systems. Uh, does that sort of dispersed nature of the tar potential targets, does that uh, hurt us more than help us? or? It can cut both ways. Yeah. I, I tend to think that, um, given the heterogeneous nature of it, um, you know, if you're going to if you're going to if you're going to beat it in, in a in a campaign style, you're going to have to actually go after some number of them. And therefore, if they're all just a little bit different from one another, then you're going to have to actually um, have enough resources to address that diversity, and you're going to have to have enough reserves behind that that when the defenders respond, you kind of have to figure out how you're going to take that next step. That's a pretty daunting proposition. I wouldn't put it against, though, a pretty aggressive, well-equipped nation state that wanted to take that on, that, that they would, right? That they would take that on, you know, one by one, block by block. Um, so having said that, I, I wouldn't get rid of the diversity, um, but I would, in fact, um, achieve a certain degree of coherence um, across those so that they had common knowledge of the threats, they had common knowledge of what best practices look like, they had common knowledge of how you actually defend these systems of interest. Um, such that they didn't all have to figure it out once again um, for their own self. Um, and I think, um, with all due credit to the folks at the Department of Homeland Security, DOD, DOJ, um, that that largely was the playbook in 2018. We were doing all of that, um, perhaps um, not as robustly and richly as we would have hoped, um, but when we woke up the day after the 2018 election, my read of the papers that I read was that, by and large, people thought that the election was fairly conducted. We didn't have the same doubts that we did perhaps after the 2016 election. And I don't think that was entirely attributable to the Russians took the year off. Uh, I think that in, in some part it was because we succeeded. Um, and, and perhaps uh, part of the lesson was to the private sector of the government does know how to be coherent in amongst itself. The government does know how to collaborate and partner right with the private sector. Um, and the state and the local institutions as, as well. But remember, part of the private sector was on the front lines of 2016 was the likes of Facebook and, and other social media organizations. And they all seemed kind of at a distance, you know, just observing what I can see, kind of with the naked eye and the presence of natural light. They all seem to be reasonably well joined up in 2018. We only hope that that then gives greater confidence to what we should then do in 2020. And you're, you're a member of the Cyber Solarium Commission, and you've been uh, work, hard at work on that. Uh, what have you found during your work on the commission that might have that you hadn't really known before or caused you to look at something in a different light that really surprised you during your work there? Uh, a couple of things. Um, and, I, and I say this from my own kind of um, 
position, I, I'm not speaking for the Solarian Commission at this point. The, the first was I have been mightily impressed with the bipartisan nature of it. Right, there are six congressmen and senators um, who are on the commission, and then there's about six mere mortals. I'm in the mere mortal category. Um, but, but you cannot find a Republican or Democrat in the room, or an independent for that matter. There's great comity um, in that room. Uh, there's been a lot of hard discussions. Um, the private sector has come in and, and put some real and material challenges on the table that we're not quite ready or not quite able to solve. I think we're ready. We're just, we just don't know yet how to solve these things. The private sector's challenge is, um, whatever you come up with, it needs to aid and abet the things that happen in the private sector because they're on the front lines of this, they're on the skirmish lines, if not, you know, the, they're not, if not on the front lines of a cyber war. Um, and, and so the first surprise has been a pleasant one, which is great comedy. The second um, is that I think that um, looking beyond, say, the 142 actions that are currently in play, don't be, don't be troubled by that. Um, you know, we're actually thinking more strategically about what then would be the strategic outcomes, which then drive the strategic lines of effort, which then drive actions that would then populate that tree. That's the thinking that's coming about. Um, and then finally, um, again, um, not so much a surprise, but, but um, a, a pleasant um, kind of um, expectation is that we do believe that we'll be held accountable um, by whether we come up with something as a cyber strategy that actually benefits the nation or the coalition of like-minded nations, as opposed to um, a, a better, more efficient, more effective use of one instrument of power, the cyber instrument of power, perhaps owned by United States Cyber Command. Because if you read the legislation, you know it is not um, it is not uncommon for folks to read the legislation that enabled the Solarium Commission to come away and say, that's real, really all about perhaps putting um, cyber power in the form of defend forward in, in the constellation of other instruments of power that are already being used. It has to be about far more than that, um, such that the military instrument's doing its part, but it's just an instrument of power, not the instrument of power. Uh, my sense as to where we're gonna go, again, not speaking for the commission, but just perhaps my own aspirations for it, is we'll come up with a, a strategy that says, how do we make use of all the talent in the room if the room is perhaps the United States of America or perhaps like-minded nations? Um, how do we actually make use of individuals, organizations, private sector, public sector, governments, plural? How do we make use of all the authorities, capabilities that exist writ large across all of those? Um, some of that is technology capability. A lot of that is the roles, responsibilities, um, individual actions that people can take. Um, and then finally, how do we actually um, kind of achieve some meaningful cyber deterrence in a world where our adversaries have, quite frankly, just run amok? If you look at 2017, WannaCry, not Petya, um, th those actions were indiscriminate, they were impactful, they were existential, um, and, and they crossed anybody's definition of a red line. So how do we push back on that without causing further chaos? And my sense is that while cyber deterrence theory is necessarily different than nuclear deterrence theory, we can learn some things from it. I think Harknet, Will Harknet said it best. Um, you know, the difference between the two is, is not least of which is that when the weapon shows up in the nuclear world, it's game over. Uh, when, when you look, when you find that you found the weapon um, you know, in the cyber world, you've just discovered reality. You know, it, it's offense persistent, it's on the field all the time. But there still is a role to, to be had or how do you make yourself resilient enough such that you know, some adversaries just don't bother or they bounce off? How do you make yourself um, kind of um, just cognizant enough and proactive enough that if somebody does still come at you, you can impose a consequence on them that makes them perhaps think about the next um, opportunity to stand back and do the right thing? And, and how do you have a sufficient degree of entanglement um, that, that you've got to beat the group, the larger group, as opposed to you can pick them off one at a time? Those strategies, I think, you know, have some um, staying power and, and should be seen in any strategy that we come up with. And I think the uh, Solarian Commission will be one of those. And you mentioned the private sector, and I feel like sometimes that is too often overlooked at cyber conferences. We talk about military strategy, defend forward. Um, but when you look at so many of the targets of some really devastating incidents, it's the private sector. And this is the same private sector where a CEO might just say that multi-factor authentication is too burdensome for their employees, so they're not going to implement it. And uh, when you look at what regulatory structure the United States has right now, it's, uh, I'll just say, not very robust. <laughs> um, and we have states starting to step in and impose their own regulations. California's goes into effect in uh, January. 
So what, what role do you think uh, government regulation should be playing in securing the private sector? Yeah, so, so in any society where they're contending interest um, and, and you know, you kind of try to figure out how to modulate them such that they all have a fair opportunity to achieve their end purpose, there's got to be some degree of expectations about standards, which then begets regulation, which then may be kind of imposed in some form of compliance. But, but we need to be modest about that. You know, we need to follow the e ethos that says, um, you know, just enough but no more. Um, and we need to make it as coherent as possible. So just by way of example, breach legislation, I think as you described, um, you know, if you're a company that operates in all 54 states and territories and you, God forbid, have a breach, you will, um, you're probably going to have to report that 54 different ways, right? That's um, kind of insane. Um, you know, that's not terribly helpful. Um, there ought to be some common standard that says this is the one way you report that out. Um, again, um, coherence will be helpful in efficiency and I think in, in terms of effectiveness. Um, having said that, um, the government while it has a regulatory and perhaps a compliance function, particularly for those um, critical functions, maybe it's financial systems, you know, the kind of air traffic control system, electrical grids, um, it, it should worry as much or more about its beneficial face as it should about its consequential face. And by that I mean, how does that actually incentivize, remove perhaps boundaries, um, perhaps uh, lower the liability proposition if in fact you've acted responsibly um, so that you flood the zone with inspired work uh, by individuals, academia, by private uh, companies. And, and so think about what the government can do to create the ecosystem within which it's a more natural act and, and perhaps um, there's some kind of financial incentive as much as a patriotic incentive for folks to essentially literally do the security work along with the dev and the ops work, right? So do sec dev ops, but do that because the government has said, what can I do to actually create an ecosystem within which that happens naturally? Um, today, I will tell you that there are many companies that are reticent, reluctant to deal with the government because they think the government strategy is to come in, find, and stab the wounded. Right? If instead, um, in dealing with the government, you've got a rich kind of access to granular, actionable information, threat information, or perhaps best practice information, you'd be more likely to deal with the government. Um, in a similar vein, against the question you've asked, if the government was joined up and essentially had the same answer in terms of what does best practice look like, what do the standards and the compliance scripts look like, um, I think that the private sector would be more willing and more able to enter into a true collaboration with the, the government itself. And now when you look at the federal government structure, cybersecurity is really scattered throughout. Are we out uh, of time yet? <laughs> Got a few, a few more questions that we might need to be out of time for. Uh, yes. Good. Um, so how do you think the government is currently structured between NSA, DHS, all of the different regulatory agencies for industry, um, NIST, you have a lot of great efforts, but are, are they coordinating enough? Do, do we need perhaps some sort of formal coordinator? Uh, do we need a Department of Cybersecurity? Yeah, so again, speaking personally, um, I, I think that the organization, if we were to look at it today, is more reflective of the 20th century than it is of the 21st, right? You know, when there were the sort of distinctions, either in terms of jurisdiction or, or actions that had some consequences that then should be either regulated or um, we should protect the society against. And, and so it's not hard to look at the current table of organization and say, that makes sense in the 20th century. It makes less sense in the 21st century, but um, it's, it's really hard and, and, and I think dangerous to just throw all of it out, the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and so then we're left with, you know, what sort of coordination um, threads can we run across that? What sort of bias for integration and collaboration can we run across that so that we over time converge, right, to either um, an organization or some processes um, that make more sense for the 21st century? So in the very near term, I do think that a cyber coordinator is essential. Right, I think that the cyber coordinator that I would imagine um, would have a responsibility to ensure that there is a national strategy, wouldn't be the person who writes it single-handedly, would have to take the influence of all the stakeholders, not least of which the private sector. But at any moment in time, we ought to know what our national aims are. We ought to know what the roles and responsibilities across the various stakeholders are. We ought to know then, kind of roughly, um, without having to take a referendum every other day, who does what to whom um, and for what reasons. 
right, such that we have some sense of this is our strategy, these are our lines of effort, these are the various roles that we all play, and we can nat naturally try to then figure out at the seams that we still enjoy, um, how do we actually collaborate across those. We, we don't want to devolve back into the to division of effort. Um, I would not have the cyber coordinator um, be um, the person who essentially then micromanages those operations uh, because it's just too complicated, there's just too much to do, and there's no person or set of persons on a small team who's clever enough, smart enough to essentially manage all the stuff that happens in the day-to-day -day royal that is cyberspace. That being said, when there's an incident, um, there almost always should be an incident manager, somebody that says, look, I, for purposes of this sharp kind of transient incident, I'm the person who essentially is going to, at least for the government's perspective, um, kind of bring to bear all of the assets, the resources of government, like a FEMA on-scene emergency manager might. Um, and I think that we have means, whether it's under PPD 41 or other processes, to, to define that. Um, finally, I'm, I, I do think that uh, there, there should be a place, a physical place, um, where we can better integrate um, the information that's coursing across all this digital infrastructure and perhaps a place where we collaborate further to try to do something about that. And, and I would just call out my British friends here on this in the most positive way, which is to say I think they've nailed it. Um, their kind of national cyber security center, um, they spell cyber in a bizarre way, uh, but having said that, I'm sorry, <laughs> center in a bizarre way, having said that, um, what they've got is they've got some number of government personnel, a significant number um, for, for them, um, standing side by side on a floor plate just across from Victoria Station where natural light is streaming in um, with their private sector counterparts, and they truly collaborate. They don't just integrate. They just don't have a data lake standing underneath them. They collaborate to try to find threat that's in common across the systems of interest, systems traditionally, typically, that perhaps might be described as critical in nature, uh, but they transcend the national kind of private sector boundary easily um, all day, every day. And, and when they then have a contingency or a crisis, uh, they don't fall back into their respective stovepipes. They lean towards one another. Um, they essentially say, now let's figure out how do we use this kind of trust relationship, this collaboration we've got to enrich it, possibly with proprietary information, possibly with classified information, such that they get stronger in the crisis, not perhaps more frayed or more um, kind of diffused in that crisis. Um, in the United States, my sense is that on our worst days, I'll, I'll cartoon this in the worst possible way, we do just the opposite. We defend in stovepipes, um, we have information that we carefully enrich inside those stovepipes such to the point it becomes proprietary or classified depending upon the stovepipe you're in. When something fires our imagination, we say, this should be shared, and, and there's a you know, noble intent on all sides. We think, how do I then share this? How do I peel off the classified you know, wrapper? How do I peel off the proprietary wrapper? How do I sanitize it, push it down such that I can then push it across? It takes days, months, weeks, or and never, um, and, and therefore we find ourselves hobbled uh, because we know too much of a singular nature in order to truly collaborate. Um, if, in fact, you did it just the opposite, let's actually share the unclassified stuff and enrich that, you stay strongly connected all the way up. That's, I think, what we need to do in terms of creating the right environment. So long story made short, regulation, compliance, important. But most breaches essentially find that there hasn't been any gross kind of abrogation of either the regulations, the standards, or the compliance. It's been some innovative, creative, new thing that nobody thought about that, that bit you um, kind of in the dark but almost always has been seen by some other party as it was coming across their network um, heading towards yours. Okay. Uh, switching topics, uh, there's a new book out by someone named Edward Snowden. Uh, do, do you like it or do you love it? No. I, uh, it's hard to say. I haven't, yeah. I haven't read it. Um, I, I spent some number of years musing over the writings and the, uh, the publicly available um, kind of utterances of Edward Snowden, and I came to the conclusion that there wasn't much there. Right, that I kind of tried to discriminate between allegations and revelations and found much of the former and not much of the latter. So, so I honestly haven't read it. Uh, but I would tell you I've learned quite a lot from that experience, if, if that's yeah. the question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess reflecting on this now, I mean, if you... Without wanna, crying. Yeah. Yes. All right, so, um, so, so here's what I learned um, from Edward Snowden. Um, a couple of things. Um, one, um, how much time do we have? So... <laughs> So how did Edward Snowden beat the National Security Agency? And to be clear, he beat the National Security Agency. Um, one, he, very clever person, um, had some amount of authority. I might describe that for those who can't see me as an envelope of sorts. Everybody operating in your organization has an envelope of authority within which they operate. Um, if they're not authorized to do anything, you have to wonder why you haven't replaced them with a machine. 
All right, so he had a certain envelope of authority, um, and, and we believe that the authority given to him, a system administrator at the National Security Agency, was big enough that he could do meaningful, useful work and small enough that he couldn't kill us if he abused those privileges. Uh, we were certainly wrong on the latter. Right, the kind of authority that a system administrator of his capability and his authority had um, could darn near be existential. Darn near was existential right in a country minute if he abused that authority. So, so that was perhaps mistake one. Mistake two was um, we actually didn't connect the dots. Remember that term of art back to 2001. Didn't connect the dots between the HR persona of one Edward Snowden, um, the IT persona of what he was actually doing while he was on the network, and the physical persona, that what he was doing on the campus. Right? There were moments across the year he did his dirty work where he showed up in the wrong place physically or he would sign off the system and not leave the campus for an hour, um, which was unusual because a contractor typically would sign off, go straight to the car. And if you reconciled what you saw in the physical look to what you then observed in the IT look with some issues that he had in his HR kind of, you know, kind of world, it um, turns out that if you reconciled those, you would have a clearer, earlier picture of this is a problem. Some, something's gone wrong here. And, and perhaps the most um, insidious uh, mistake that we made with Edward Snowden um, was that um, not understanding what it means to be a contractor in a workplace where you know, there's certain kind of expected rights, privileges, respect accorded to folks who have um, a blue badge as opposed to a green badge, that if you're a line NSA employee, if you're a line government employee, Right? You're an inherently governmental person. You get to make inherently governmental choices. If you're a contractor, and I'll put this in the most negative way possible, if you're a contractor, um, you're a commodity. Um, you're expected to come in, sit down at your desk, and do what you're supposed to do, and nothing more. If we wanted your opinion, we would have hired you, given you a 30% pay cut, and hired you as a government employee and put you over here in this seat. If you've got a large ego and a fairly clever head, and perhaps you feel like the world hasn't been quite fair to you, and you're a contractor sitting in that seat, and something happens that you're not happy with, you're not likely to immediately reach out to your fellow kind of workers, your kindred spirits, because you don't believe that they are kindred spirits, right? You're kind of an alien in a strange land, and you might then be tempted to go straight to the mic. That doesn't justify or excuse what Edward Snowden did, um, but we didn't make ourselves, kind of, we didn't put ourselves in a place where we could either have caught that earlier, um, where we perhaps could have given him some alternatives. So maybe I do feel like I've got some responsibility to Joe or Jane or Sue or my boss. Right? Maybe I've got some responsibility here first, um, such that I'll kind of try to affect whatever remedies I'm after here, not Hong Kong. Right? Last thing that I think I would look back on, and these are all perhaps moments of regret, and I don't need to read the book to get this, um, is that I think I would have go, I'd go back in time. If I had a time machine, I'd go back before 2013. Maybe I'd go back to 2000 and I'd speak to Edward Snowden's parents and say, it's a bad idea, you shouldn't do this, right? So you just should not have a child. Right? It's not gonna work out well for you. Um, no, I wouldn't do that. I, I would go back in time um, to years before um, this and I would have a fuller, more transparent conversation with the American people. Now, why didn't we do that at the time? Why didn't I do that at the time? Uh, because I thought, and I still think, we were being completely transparent and responsive to those who stood in the shoes of the American people the executive branch, the judicial branch, right, the legislative branch, I mean, to a fairly well. Uh, we shared all those details. It wasn't a surprise to anyone when the truth came out as opposed to the allegations came out. But the American people had long ago given up on um, those elected representatives to fully represent their views. Um, and the American people, I'm um, being naturally suspicious of American government, maybe I blame that on my British friends back in the year 1775, but that's another story. The American people being naturally suspicious and perhaps skeptical, um, they need to know more than a vacuum. They need to know that an, NS, an, NS, an NSA exists. They need to know what for, for what purposes, what are the natural limitations of what NSA does, and how would I have confidence that NSA is constrained to the noble purpose for which it's established. If I don't know what those bookends are, then I perhaps am going to suspect that this terrible beast of a surveillance organization, and that's at the end of the day what a large part of NSA is, but a surveillance of things that it should legitimately surveil, then I kind of might assume that this thing in the middle is a beast and, it, and it's perhaps off the rails. So when Edward Snowden essentially then spoke into that vacuum, he raced right across it, filled it in a nanosecond. Um, it gave kind of rise to people's kind of innate fears about what NSA might do. And I think that we could have checked that. Trust me, if you're kind of telling your story second, and you're, especially if you're behind somebody that's vilifying your story, it's not a game you can win. The best you can do is to perhaps get to the scene of the crime just about the time it's burned down. Last thing I would say is that um, 
I, I don't forgive Edward Snowden for, for what he did. I thought that he was reckless. I thought that he's not a whistleblower in any way, shape, or form. He's probably earned his reward, right, permanent domicile in uh, Moscow. I don't forgive him any of that, um, but, but we are in a better place because of it, right? We have thought our way through most of those things. I do think that we've got a different compact um, with all of our overseers and with the American public. Um, but, but him having burned the house down and we having rebuilt the house, I don't like the arson anymore. I just like the opportunity that we got to perhaps turn that crisis, turn that disaster into something of a positive nature. So. Okay. So, so uh, with the time remaining, I'm assuming there are some audience questions. Uh, I have no idea. I hear there's a box that you have to speak into of some sort. Um, but it, if anyone has any questions, okay. Yes, um, kind of piggybacking on your last point about uh, going into public, uh, NBR, NPR uh, did an article online uh, recently in September, and General Nakasone and four other generals were directly attributed and quoted uh, uh, discussing and describing our uh, counter ISIS operations task force Ares. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, coming out in the public? That's kind of a culture shock. It was a culture shock. I, I thought it was uh, well done. Um, it's, um, it, it's something that goes back to the comments I was making, which is, American public needs to know a couple of things. One is, you know, what are the formal responsibilities of agencies like NSA or kind of organizations like the United States Cyber Command? Why do we have those? Why do we spend so much money, time, trouble, energy on those? Um, two, what, what do they actually achieve in the world? Do they actually make a meaningful difference? Um, I, th I think that many might be surprised to know that they don't lie in wait for some crisis, for some Pearl Harbor, some balloon to go up. There's actually, they're steadily engaged on a daily basis. Um, I can still remember testifying at some point to some organization who shall remain nameless um, when I was asked how many terrorist attacks have there been in the United States since 2001 attributable to a foreign terrorist organization and I thought I was kind of about to enter a proud moment and I said none and the person said well then why do we need the NSA, right? Because we hadn't told them enough about what actually we do, right? What, what actually happens day after day after day. Um, now those who would argue against a, a release of that sort would say but you're giving your playbook away to an adversary. Uh, there are two things I would say about that. One is, if, if the adversary is under kind of constant harassment, if they're kind of constantly on the run, uh, they might know too fairly well what they should be doing, but they're going to do the expedient, right? They're just still going to make stupid mistakes, right? And many of the things that we do to take advantage of people who we should take advantage of, the mistakes they're making are the same ones the Nazis made in World War II, the Japanese made just before the Battle of Midway, right? So they're still people, right? So that's the thing um, at the end of the day. And, and two, there's a sufficient amount of dynamic, dynamism, uh, it's a dynamic system, um, such that um, the, the ways you perhaps succeed today are necessarily be different than tomorrow and the next day. And so it's the old Doritos commercial, you know, you eat those, we'll make more. Right? And, and so I, I just think that, that I would err in favor of actually telling the American people something more without perhaps being too aggressive in that um, and, and, and understand that at the end of the day that, that it, it is a compromise, right? But we have to align these two great needs, one for people to know something about what you do with the money I gave you, are, are you doing illicit things or noble things, and, and two, not telling too much. I think we have over two. So back to the Snowden. Lessons learned. Have you read the book? Say again? Did you read the book? I have not. Bless you. Right, sorry. I have not. <laughs> um, but I, I've been at the NSA and at the Cyber Command for the last 12 years and, um, and appreciate the damage that he, he offered not just to our country, but to the morale and culture of mm -hmm. an organization. And I'm appreciative not of what he did or how he did it, but that he did raise a question that, the, that our, our nation needed to discuss. The role of the US government and the role of the NSA and the authorities and capabilities that we afford them. And it raised an important question. My assertion, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, is that we did not resolve that conversation. We did not run that conversation to its necessary conclusion in order to avoid for further problems. So say more about that. Why, where do you think we've fallen short in terms of perhaps saying, having enough of a transparent conversation such that we're about to surprise the American public again is what I gather you mean? I believe that the people lost track of it due to an, 
a lack of attention rather than a true understanding and a deliberate choice about what authorities and capabilities should be offered. I don't believe that question was ever politically resolved. I'll, I'll cede the time to you to, to share more light and wisdom on that. But um, I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to repeat this experience if we, if we don't have a more clear articulation. Yeah, so I, I, I do agree if you were to do a poll of 315 million Americans or however many there are out there and, and kind of ask them, what do you know about NSA? Um, you might be disappointed that you know, we're, we're, they're not that into us, right? So they, they don't know that much about us. Uh, and that's just the nature of the beast, right? There's so many things going on in so many different lives. But, but for those that perhaps um, kind of um, are formally responsible to engage in that dialogue, to, they're held accountable, the Congress, the judiciary, I think it, that we have gotten to a good place. It's not the perfect place because it's still in alignment where there's some tension. We haven't actually achieved a perfect um, kind of you know, um, accomplishment of national security and the privacy that you know, some people think you know, is, is directly um, kind of at, at odds with that. My sense is that they actually can be brought into alignment if you work harder to deliver both. But, but I think that most folks that are in the accountable chairs are, are like, I think I've worked my way through that and I'm comfortable with that. There might still be some kind of hard right, hard left noise that comes up, uh, but I don't like the current accommodation, but they do understand it, right? Um, the judiciary, stable, kind of, you know, they, they, they've got great sight lines on this. Uh, some of the most interesting conversations I had when I was deputy director, uh, perhaps not the most fun conversations, uh, with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Anybody thinks that they're kind of the feckless pawns of the executive branch has never met them. Right? So, um, you know, there's lots of room on the bus, and I used to tell people, if you want to get out and meet with those, come with me, and the bus was always empty. It's just me. Um, but, but I think they're actually, actually in a pretty good place. Um, I think that we also, the, the American public has the benefit, sometimes it's the burden, but they have the benefit of the matting press, the fourth estate, which, which has been kind of through this like, um, like, like holes through Swiss cheese. Right, in and out and all over, um, such that just about everything that could be explored, everything that could be exposed, you know, is lying there on the table. Um, to your point, I don't think that we've reconciled it for all time. Um, there, there's a particular issue, Jeff might ask me about this, um, hopefully we'll run out of time, uh, but which is the going dark problem. Right? We haven't actually solved that. Um, you know, there's the, kind of one part of the American um, kind of body politic says, we need to use strong encryption no matter what the consequences are, right? WhatsApp, you know, kind of end-to-end -end encryption. And another that would say, a relative minority that would say, yeah, but we need to give law enforcement the ability to get into that. It's perceived as a contest between privacy and national or domestic collective security. And we haven't fully settled that. But my view of the Constitution, again, kind of in deference to the true lawyers in the room, is we have to figure that out every iteration of technology, every generation. It doesn't endure over time according to static rules and principles that the, the values underneath do, but, but the technology principles and the rules that we might say, this is this iteration of this, uh, they necessarily change, right? Because the technology gives us different scope and scale, because the sensibilities of the American public in terms of what they believe should be private, what they believe is exposed, they change. Um, and so we just have to continue to keep that right in front of us and to work it day after day after day. Um, I, I guess I, some part of me can agree with you, um, but, but a large part of me says that um, if we had a further discussion about it, we would simply dig into kind of polarized positions. And, and so we need to go forward and see if we can't work with the 80% in the middle that we have reconciled and said that this is the right accommodation, the right alignment, and then start to work those harder problems that kind of lie just ahead, like the going dark problem. Okay. Uh, thank you for all the great insights. Uh, Chris, what do you think the NSA is going to evolve to be like in 2040? What do I think it's going to be like in 2040? Yes. What's going to maybe stay the same? What's, what's got to change? I know you mentioned entanglement and things like that. Do you think we'll be different uh, 20 years from now? Yeah, so um, first of all, I think that it'll still have wicked smart people. Um, you know, they've begun to hire wicked smart people. When I left, they started hiring wicked smart people. 
Um, it'll still be people that are kind of extraordinarily nobly, they show up for the right purposes, as I used to tell the NSA workforce, not for the swell parking, because we didn't have swell parking, <laughs> not for the great pay, but, but they'll show up for the right reasons and they'll just be wicked, you know, kind of smart. And that happy combination of brilliance and noble purpose, I think will continue to make NSA exceed or kind of enable NSA to exceed the expectations of its adversaries, true adversaries, right? You know, the ones that essentially hold this nation at risk. Um, as to the nature of the work that they do, and, and you're going to ask me about the composition of the workforce, I'll go to that in a minute. The nature of the work they do, uh, I don't see in the next 20 years that there'll be a fundamental difference um, you know, in terms of the two centers of gravity which occasionally have intersected, occasionally have wafted apart. We're now just teasing them apart just a little bit. Right? There's the signals intelligence mission now more broadly is how do we tease intelligence out of communications from one party to another across what I would describe as digital or analog infrastructure, but across telecommunications slash digital infrastructure. And then how do we actually, using that as a source of information, um, devise what we know to be best practices and the composition of either parts or systems that we can then say are reasonably re robust and resilient and then can be defended. Those will be two, the two centers of gravity in the year 2040. Now you've suggested in your question a slightly different possibility, which is there might be some degree of greater integration you know, between NSA and the private sector, academia, and, and I hope that that is true. It's still really hard for somebody to come into the National Security Agency, say, at the eight-year or 10-year or 20-year point in their career. Because if, if you don't have the perception of having been born there, it's hard to understand the culture. It's hard to kind of get um, kind of reconciled to the different way that it thinks, uh, the absence of natural light, things of that sort. Um, <laughs> So, so my view would be, um, and, and there are some clearance reform issues along these lines, and there's some strategies that are being uh, argued by think tanks along these lines. We, could sh we should make it easier for somebody from NSA to flow into the private sector, from somebody in the private sector to flow into NSA, such that you have a lifetime credit, or maybe a lifetime passport that says, like, you, you can come back anytime. Right? Or you can leave right, and go back into the private sector and do whatever you do, but, but have a consideration that having once been a part of this, that you've got some lifetime street cred to come back into this. Don't think that it's a one and done, either in the private sector or the public sector kind of um, responsibility. And that might also help this notion of, do we understand what NSA is? Right? You know, in the 60s, 70s, when you know, a, a significant number of people, you know, who had once been in the military felt like they were at NSA because they were in the cryptologic components. There was a body of support in just about every village in the nation. Now it's much like the military. Two percent of the people in the United States have been in the military or know somebody in the military. It's harder to have a sense as to what the military does. So I hope that there's some freer flow of, of people back and forth in 2040. And, and lastly, I hope that I still have a badge in 2040 and can go to NSA. So hopefully you'll find an old guy on the campus, right, you know roaming around looking for a parking spot. <laughs> so uh, you've mentioned the National Cybersecurity Center is a good model for cooperating between private industry and, and government. Um, it seems like maybe we're headed in the opposite direction, like you have Project Maven with Google. Um, private industry doesn't seem to want to work very closely, especially with the DOD, but with government in general. Right. So how do you think we kind of move toward that National Cybersecurity Center model? Yeah, so first of all, I would say that uh, my view is, and, and again, um, kind of attack this, take it with a grain of salt it deserves, um, is the private sector is not monolithic, right? There, there's, there's probably three, but more, but I'll just say three clusters at least. You know, those folks that might be the ones who say, I don't want to work with Maven, I don't want to support, right, you know, inherently militaristic activities. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of, oftentimes they're wedded to technology for its own sake. They believe it has purely noble goals and that it should be applied to those purposes alone, right? There's nothing ignoble about that. And, and they tend to believe that, um, that this should be done for the benefit of all mankind. And I don't say that to belittle it, but, but they have that kind of global worldview, which again, not ignoble in that regard. Um, forgetting that there are in fact uh, malicious actors in the world who are constituted as nation states. That's not, again, to belittle their view. Uh, but that's a cluster of, of organizations. There's a second group, um, a cluster that actually has to build and operate global infrastructure, right? The three-letter organizations who essentially kind of build um, internet service provisioning, um, who essentially then build out, uh, you know, whether it's 5G, 4G, or kind of all that stuff. 
Um, and, and they, having gotten into that and operating in some very difficult environments, contested environments, both stateside and overseas, understand the truer nature of the world because they actually have to deliver that business all day, every day, against true adversaries. They lean in and they want a relationship with the government, um, a relationship that's a two-way relationship. They say, look, there are some, th some things that you are authorized by the, the government is authorized to know these things, maybe because you have an NSA. Um, you're authorized to know these things, and we'd like to know those things that are appropriate for us to know, such that we might use the benefit of your hard-won information to defend the enterprises that underpin your critical infrastructure. That's a relationship that, that should be aided and abetted. And I see a lot of companies in that box that say, I want a relationship. I just want to know that when I show up, you're going to give me something that's useful in that relationship. And then there's a third cluster um, that actually operates on top of that global infrastructure, and they feel perhaps most at risk. Right? Because uh, they, they don't build and operate the infrastructure that is a commodity for them. They do operate in a lot of very difficult environments, not to single them out, but take an organization like Maersk. Right? They operate just about every country in the world. And when NotPetya came out and essentially blew away right, the underpinning digital infrastructure, um, I'll bet that they wanted a relationship with some government at that moment in time that would say, hey, how can you tell me something about the nature of the geopolitical situation such that I can see that sucker punch coming? How can you tell me something about how you're going to use your inherently instrument, government instruments of power to hold that aggressor at bay using diplomacy, using criminal sanctions, using whatever that is, because the kind of the capabilities within a single organization and some amount of insurance, which might transfer some of that risk to an insurer, are insufficient to hold, right, your, hold your own against you know, a world that has true aggressors in it that are simply reckless, irresponsible, and, and essentially uncowled. Right, so if you think about those three boxes, those latter two boxes, stunning opportunities for governments, plural, to say, hey, I'd like to reach out and help to you. And it's my sense that when you look at, and again, not, not having been there more than twice, when you look at the floor at the National Cybersecurity Center, you see pretty strong representation of those latter two sectors there on that floor. Now, we would love to see that some degree of innovation, some degree of how do we take the latest and greatest in analytics and AI and all of that to make that operation more efficient. I think that will naturally occur. But we have to describe the noble purpose and the constraints and controls on that such that those, that first cluster that I talked about will say, yeah, this is for the benefit of the world when we do this. Right? And, and I think any nation that comes up with a cyber strategy that says we depend upon a relationship, a collaboration with other nations, is going to be more likely to draw that first cluster out of their corner and, and into the room to say, I'll make a contribution to that. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Michim and Vina. My question is, you talked earlier about how other like foreign intelligence services would make mistakes if they're occupied and being harassed by um, our forces in cyberspace. Um, with the strategy to defend forward, could you see those same pitfalls being uh, a threat to the United States uh, with us constantly pursuing um, engagement with, a, with our foreign adversaries? And then um, how would we mitigate those uh, if they're compounded by the fact that we're facing multiple adversaries all with different national strategies? It's a great question. Uh, it's a hard question. Let me make it a little bit harder. Um, so, so I think you've asked the goose and the gander question, right, in, in the end game, which is, so if we can defend forward um, and show up on somebody else's kind of front doorstep, um, what if somebody does that to us, right? Um, and, and I'll answer the other question as well, but let me answer that question first, because it's the harder question. Uh, I think that it's important to kind of think about defend forward as being kind of, it, 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 by intention, about defense. That's why the first word is, is defend. It's about defense and therefore requires that you have actually some justification for defending against whatever it is you're defending. I'm not going to show up on your doorstep if you're not a threat to me. This really is about the defense. If you're a provocateur, if you're an aggressor, if, if historically or in terms of my understanding of what capabilities you've kind of developed and how you've aimed those and brought those to bear, if you're truly a threat to me, then I have every justification in the world to defend against you at the highest point of leverage I enjoy, which is your front doorstep. But if you are not a provocateur, if you're not an aggressor, if you don't constitute a real threat to me, then you don't have the right, I don't have the right to show up on your doorstep. And by the same token, if I'm not that to you, you don't have the right to show up on more door, my doorstep. So, so I think we need to play that all the way through in terms of you know, how then can't that be used against us? If we're not a threat to others in the world, then they shouldn't be doing that. Um, the question you've asked, though, is in a world where you're moving fast and Perhaps um, you, kind of, you, you kind of favor expedience as opposed to the due diligence of checklist, and I'm going to do this carefully, I'm going to be perfect. We just have to make sure that our people 
right, are as much a part of our defensive um, apparatus as the technology that we place at their disposal. That every person who essentially is engaged in cyber operations knows that, that while they might think that they're just an offensive operator in a certain case, they're always a defensive operator as well. They're always a point of attack. They're always an attack surface for an adversary that's looking back at them. If they think they've got a gun barrel, there's an adversary looking down that gun barrel, and they just need to make sure that they're not the source of either giving away, tipping your hand to what capabilities you're using, under what circumstances, or not opening some fissure or some door such that an adversary can come, back, come marching in. Um, and if everyone um, kind of believes, no matter where you are in the organization, you're a part of the defense of that organization, will be less likely, not impossible, but less likely to make the kind of mistakes that show up as tactical errors that give an adversary an advantage. And, and our feature, I think, liberal democracies especially, in being as diverse as we are and essentially trying to figure out how to effect joint operations, right, from multiple capabilities, um, is that we generally have worked really hard on the horizontal. We've worked really hard on how do we join up and make it such that every one of us is a component of that front line as opposed to operating singly kind of in our stovepipes. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Sir, just a follow-on question for that. Uh, if we're going to kind of unleash this norm of defending forward, how do we make sure that it's defensive in nature and doesn't cause preemption and preemptive uh, defensive attacks so we kind of shape it the way we want it to instead of kind of going down a darker road? Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to observe this without actually having the details to back it up, but, but I, I think hypothetically, or at least in terms of um, the, the objectively visible unclassified information would backstop me on this. I think if you have a certain authority under Defend Forward and, and mindful of in 2018, the doctrine changed, right, such that we're no longer going to be kind of reacting well, simply reacting well. We're going to be persistent engagement, forward defense. Um, the kind of the strategy changed, the Department of Defense strategy changed to essentially make it such that within the context of that, that made sense, and the law changed. And the law said that we're going to treat this as a traditional military activity and that we're not going to have it be so extraordinary that the president alone can approve it. We're going to delegate some amount to this. Having done that, some might have observed, oh my goodness, we've just let this kind of banshee out of the box and it'll be racing out of the room, shrieking all the time. To my observation, that's not occurred, right? We've actually made a quite conservative use of that capability. Um, such that no one could accuse Cyber Command or the components operating for Cyber Command of having overused that authority. We haven't actually unleashed hell right on the adversary, uh, to my way of observation. Uh, we've used that in some few discrete cases. Um, they've not actually kind of taken down you know, large swaths of the intervening kind of the stuff between us and perhaps an appropriate target of interest. Um, and thus, we've demonstrated necessity and proportionality in ways that we'd say, I think I can actually trust the kind of authority holder in this case, despite the fact that it's not at the top of the food chain, it's somewhere closer to the edge of that food chain. That will be a standard of performance, while not formally imposed by the law, that, that we should continue to kind of take a look at. We should continue over time to say, have you in fact made good and judicious use of this, such that you continue to be a trusted steward of that capability? In my view, it's a so far so excellent proposition. Okay. Um, we might have time if anyone has one more quick question. Um, don't see anything. So, uh, with that, if you could join me in thanking Chris for taking the time for this great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.